All right. This week we're going to be going over distance running. Um, so welcome, coaches. Uh, when it comes to distance running, we're going to be getting into a little bit more event specific. I'm going to try to keep it real general as it relates to this lecture. And hopefully in the week we can address some more complicated or in-depth concepts of distance running and distance training. Um, like any of the events, if you have a lot of experience in this event area, you probably have a lot of opinions or probably really strong opinions um, when it comes to the training and the technical pursuits. <coughs> so when it comes to the general aspects of distance running, we're just going to go over some basic components and hopefully give some semblance to those that might not have a lot of um, experience in this area. So those that do, please take notes as it relates to maybe questions that you might have to help deepen your thought when it comes to the way you train and prepare training for your athletes. Some of the things that we're going to cover just lifestyle and general considerations when it comes to training distance runners. Um, and when we say distance runners, we are lumping in the 800 and 1500, even though those are considered mid distance due to the metabolic demand and um, some of the speed power components associated with those events, especially at the higher levels. But so, but we're just going to keep it kind of general here. And we're just going to talk about um, the anywhere from the 800 all the way up to the marathon. When we talk about lifestyle and general considerations, we're just talking about some of the fundamental aspects of what it takes to be a distance runner, you know, and though these things might not be unique to distance running, um, they might be able to encompass track and field athletes as a whole, but we'll talk about maybe some of the smaller nuances and how they phase into being a little bit more specific for distance runners. We're gonna talk about a little bit of technique and skill uh, hopefully we can loop this back up when we meet during the week and talk about some of the technique and running economy components associated with training. And we'll talk about the skills associated with distance running um, because we are going to introduce a little bit of steeplechase. And so uh, the hurdles <laughs> come into play or the hurt, at least hurdle mobility and hurdle training. Training factors, there's some general elements of how to coordinate training and we're going to really look at some charts to break down the differences between aerobic training and anaerobic training and what specific races um, are benefited from different types of training when it comes to aerobic and anaerobic capacity. So what kind of training is more beneficial for an 800 meter runner versus a 10,000 meter runner? We're going to look at those and give some charts charts that um, kind of break up um, the, the distribution of training. Then we're going to go through an event breakdown. We're just going to look at the different events and kind of the smaller nuances as it relates to those events. And then lastly, we're just going to slightly touch on some biomechanic considerations and some periodization components. But a lot of those are just going to be um, references to what we've talked about in the past. So safety considerations, some of the big safety considerations that I want to bring up is just like road runs, uh, making sure that your athletes are aware of like how to navigate streets and other high traffic areas when it comes to running, that we're being safe and considerate of all the rules of the road, um, you know, being aware of headphones and, um, you know, there's, they're making headphones really good now, which is cool, but it's also bad because our athletes' awareness goes down and they feel like they're a million bucks when they're running with their headphones. Uh, we really, uh, you know, kind of shy away from having athletes run, or at least especially like road runs with headphones. It's just important to be aware of your surroundings. When it comes to other training resources, just training surfaces, um, you know, a lot of people really want to harp on staying away from like concrete or the pavement. And we have to be aware of that just because the impact that our athletes incur when they do run consistently on pavement and concrete takes a toll on the body. So we have to look at how we're coordinating our training and maybe you're landlocked and you're on a concrete jungle. So you have to manage how you navigate your training and how much load and how many road miles you're putting in with your athletes. 
And so I'd rather my athletes be bored running small grass loops than, um, you know, being constantly subjected to the pounding of a pavement. When it looks at when we look at footwear, uh, constantly good rotation in terms of footwear is is ideal. But obviously, for some of our athletes, that might not be realistic. Um, so keeping in mind, you know, how we use footwear and making sure that we're you know, talking to our athletes about taking care of their running shoes, um, using different insoles versus the ones that come standard in the shoes. That's a good way to help prolong the shoe longevity or and, you know, help, help benefit some of the athletes, whether it's like they're they're supinating or something like that. This kind of these are elements that really come into play. Um, environmental issues like a while ago in Southern California, there was like fires. So the air quality was really compromised and we had to make sure that we you know modified our training because of that and so just those are just some general things right to keep our athletes safe and then um like i mentioned before running in traffic making sure they're hydrating just because it's cold sometimes they don't hydrate as much um, especially when we're, we're going to talk a little bit about heat and heat exhaustion and how that comes into play but i think for us as coaches we have to really take a, um, a hard look at you know, how we're promoting nutrition, uh, making sure that, I mean, there was a time on Thursdays, it was where we knew we had hard workouts, where we told our athletes to kind of bring their lunch. And we did like a little picnic thing where we almost made them eat, you know, and bring lunch. So we knew that they consumed something right then and there. And it was kind of like a fun thing. They brought snacks and stuff and we had our water or Gatorade out and they were able just to kind of cool down and, you know, hang out a little bit right before a class and, uh, and, but we're promoting, you know, eating something right after a hard workout, which helped with morale and obviously, you know, maybe help instill some good nutritional and hydration habits with our athletes. Dehydration, you know, the kind of the thing I like to say, it, like, you know, you probably heard it before. But if you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated, right? When it comes to dehydration, it thickens the blood, making it harder to pump blood through the tissue because obviously a major part of um, distance running and distance running success is stroke volume and being able to uh, use the substrate of oxygen to allow for energy production through pyruvate and things like that. It also significantly uh, significant fluid loss occurs through extended activity. So we have to understand as as we sweat, this also um, creates a level of dehydration that we must be aware of. And so obviously with hotter or um, more increased weather temperatures, because sometimes like humidity comes into play, you know, like it, the temperature might not be high, but the humidity is high. And so therefore perspiration is um, much more likely. Each pound of fluid loss must be replaced by 16 to 24 ounces of water with electrolytes added, ideally. Um, these electrolytes help with the fluid distribution and reallocation because sometimes without the electrolytes, our body doesn't recognize it as well and it doesn't allow for the um, replenishment and distribution. So there is a, there is a fine line with that, right? Like I remember being down in the Caribbean and we had some athletes, some sprinters that, you know, we had to... We didn't have any anything around us. So we used salt and that was just something we used salt water that helped, you know, replenish them and help, you know, promote some of those um, rehydration aspects. Um, this is an, an increased concern with high temperature and high humidity. So just being aware of the weather um, and, you know, it's funny because I'm not like a weather person. So I make sure I surround myself and I have like people designated around me to be like the weather people that just like doing that. They like looking up the weather. They, and so, you know, um, for me, I'm not, and that's one thing that I wish I was better at is just trying to be aware of the weather, but I don't look at it. And so, um, you know, during like heavy training weeks, I have, I have a specific athlete that is like my, my weather person. And they text me the weather the day before and the day, you know, uh, you know, two days, hey, coach, it's about to rain this week or this and this and the humidity is supposed to be high and that they love it. Right. And so whether it's a coach or somebody or you might be yourself, but constantly be aware of the weather and in the changing in climates as it relates to your training, because you might have to modify that week based on some of the um, like inclement weather. 
heat concerns, the body sheds heat through um, evaporation of the skin. When humidity is high, the evaporation and the cooling is inhibited. So therefore, our dehydrate, like we're not able to recognize um, some of this evaporation. Athletes must adjust um, their pace when the heat and humidity is um, dictated. So obviously making sure we modify our training accordingly. And we're also advised to understand that the effects of heat and humidity by using a heat index will help um, with, with this. So this is a heat index chart when it comes to, um, you know, relative humidity and, and the temperature and where it could be considered more detrimental or high risk. So just to keep in mind. Iron concerns. Um, I, I like to first caution, you know, coaches to stay in their lane when it comes to, um, you know, prescribing or dictating whether athletes should be um, taking iron supplements. Okay, that's not our job. But if we do see an athlete that does seem like they might be anemic or have some concerns that uh, might warrant um, possible supplementation, recommend they see a physician, especially if you're in the collegiate or scholastic ranks. Um, if you're in a, you know, coaching elite or youth, youth go to the parents um, and elite athletes, make sure you get a physician or a physio that can help with this. Um, a decrease in the serum, um, ferritin levels, obviously, low iron directly impacts the quality and the quantity of work a runner could do. Um, and then the iron deficiency can cause overtraining. When it comes to this iron deficiency, it doesn't, it's not always going to be based on nutrition. Um, sometimes some athletes are predisposed to having iron deficiencies a little bit more naturally. Like um, I mentioned anemia and things like that. That's just like the most common. Um, it found decreased volume and intensity of work and increased the iron level through good nutrition and iron supplementation. So making sure that the, there's quality nutrition first and then after they get their nutrition together, then you can recommend that they go see a physician or somebody or a nutritionist or dietitian to help with iron supplementation if needed. So when we look at a, endurance racing, um, you know, there's the start and and when we look at the start, you know, there's a waterfall start. There's also a staggered start. Um, there's alley runs where they put them in at least two or three alleys and allow them to run the stacker out. Uh, we look at the toughness of things to be a runner. Like, we're looking at now just a break line. Um, break line is something that they usually mess up because athletes sometimes, especially when they're young, they really kind of... Put the, they really put themselves in a position that they kind of try to go straight to the inside of the track instead of create a more less severe angle to try to merge into the first lane. And so that helps um, when it comes to packing in and things like that. It is very physical. If you ever watch like a get out of a, um, you know, a high impact alley race, you know, there is some level of physicality and bumping and things like that. Make sure your athletes are aware of what's going on. Running mechanics, so sprint drills and hill running. This can help with your athletes when it comes to being able to overcome some of the more uh, physical demands and fatigue associated with it, build up some of the, the running strength components, um, posture alignment. This is usually done through core, core training um, and strength conditioning, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Be aware of overstriding. Um, some distance runners try, you know, try to really take advantage of the stride, le the stride length and stride frequency thing, um, and they overstride. And when they overstride, they cast out in front of them. That foot blocks them off, and it creates this, you know, breaking action. So as we're watching them, um, these 800 meter runners transition into this. So we watched them in their start, um, and now we're watching them come through to the finish line. If you're looking, they're transitioning into some pretty good sprint mechanics. Obviously their body's at, you know, um, a high lactate level, lactate level. So uh, they're not gonna be as responsive, but um, it's more about running economy and running efficiency. So if there is a, too much uh, twisting and things like that, though they might feel strong, they won't be able to make the move that they need to be able to finish, um, 
you know, ahead of somebody else. So race pace and race distribution. So you want to develop target splits. This is really good for, um, you know, the example we give here is like the 800 meters slightly faster than the 400 meters um, when it comes to, you know, splitting races. How do you get your target splits? Uh, there's a lot of charts out there and a lot of books. If you guys want, um, you can email me and I can send you some charts that I have. Um, and I have it all the way from, you know, and there's also a running calculator book that I can recommend. Um, I'll maybe send a link out a little bit later, but the running calculator helps give you splits based on individuals, PRs and in their races. And it's usually a good indicator and it kind of helps. Um, it's not gonna be perfect, but it's going to be pretty close. And when it comes to developing these splits, sometimes practice is going to give you as you train, you're going to find out what your athletes capabilities are. That's why when we go back to the very beginning, when it comes to developing training, we have to develop acceleration first because we have to build up to some top speed to be able to handle a certain level of velocity. But with um, race distribution now for longer events, you know, are you going to negative split or even split? Um, what are your what's your split distribution? What is your athletes capable of um, physically and mentally? Race positioning and being boxed in. How do you handle that? Um, and you don't, you don't force your way through. You have to learn how to strategically bounce out. Don't do it on a curve. You don't want to run on the, the wide part or outside lane when you're coming on a curve. You want to make your move coming off of a curve if you're going to try to unbox yourself or reposition yourself. Um, those are, be those moves are best done coming off of a curve, not into a curve. So teaching your athletes that because sometimes, uh, less mature athletes usually feel more comfortable trying to make a move on a curve because there's less um, there's less resistance there. People let them bounce out on the curve, especially if they're running against more mature runners. They'll let them bounce out and run on that wide curve, but um, so they will f find less resistance there. So they'll try to take advantage of that, and um, they'll usually pay for it. Um, training adaptation, training influences the following uh, neuromuscular system improvements, improvement in the energy systems, training the aerobic and anaerobic systems um, concurrently, and making sure we're aware of the balance and the ratios that we're using for our athletes' um, particular, um, you know, event demand. So when we look at it, you know, energy systems, training um, of appropriate levels of work in both the aerobic and anaerobic systems is dictated by the event choice. So, you know, if we look, the aerobic um, percentage for the 400 is 43% and 57% anaerobic. And this is what we would consider moderate levels. Um, higher, higher levels, um, you're going to be kind of shifting from the aerobic to anaerobic a little bit more. So like, for instance, like an elite men's race is probably going to be a little bit more than 16% anaerobic. And that's just kind of the, 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 because of the pace and intensity in which they compete at. Aerobic and lactate thresholds. So the level of work dictates the substrate used. Okay, heart rate can be a good indicator of workload. So sometimes we, we find out what our max heart rate is and our resting heart rate. And these are usually good indicators. That's why like heart rate monitors were a big thing, you know, maybe like five to 10 years ago when it came to monitoring distance runners. Not so much anymore because they have some oxidation machines and some other high, highly technical things, but heart rate still can be used to give you a general indicator of where your athletes are as it relates to intensity. Um, substrates you use like fatty acids when your heart rate zone is about 60 to 70 percent of your maximum heart rate and that's going to be stored in your muscle cells glycogen is going to be 75 percent or more of your maximum heart rate and this is also going to be glycogen that is stored in your muscle cells and your liver because at that point remember that the glucose in your blood is already going to be burnt out okay from if depending on the intensity, especially if you're you know, the higher intensity. 
the aerobic threshold versus the lactate threshold. So aerobic threshold is about 60 to 70%, 75% of your VO2 max. There's a lot of different ways to determine your VO2 max, and I highly recommend that you try to find your VO2 max, your athlete's VO2 max early in the middle and at the end. This helps, um, especially in cross season. Um, and we can go into more of that later. Lactate threshold is at 85 to 90 percent of your VO2 max, so pretty high intensity. The runner's goal is to increase oxygen available for aerobic metabolism. So, what does that mean? It's it's pretty much identifying oxygen as being a primary substrate. So, the more efficient your aerobic system is, the more oxygenated blood that you're going to just be able to distribute for um, energy replenishment. Lactate threshold represents the fastest speed a runner can maintain without a significant anaerobic contribution. So we're really trying to push the envelope here and not get overly lac lactic -y, I guess that's a word, or um, get kind of flushed with lactic, kind of get that heavy feeling. Anaerobic training. So the two anaerobic systems are alactic and glycolytic. Training of the glycolytic system helps the body use lactate as fuel. So a lactic, you're using the phosphorus creatine, and this is within the six to ten seconds. And there is no byproduct. There is no like um, aftermath because this phosphorus creatine is already there. Um, and so when we're looking at this, this is all contingent on the level of intensity. So um, Pretty much, you can almost go at 100% for that 6 to 10 seconds without any negative contribution or negative, um, you know, impact. But after that, um, depending on your intensity, you're getting to the glycolytic. You're using glycogen stored in the blood. And this is about 10 to 90 seconds of pretty intense activity. And then the, the byproduct is the hydrogen ions. We always you usually reference it as like lactic acid, right? It's a lactic threshold, but it's the hydrogen ions that have more of a detrimental impact when it comes to um, the tightness of muscles and that I call it like muddy water, right? Now your blood's starting to thicken and its um, ability to produce energy is and distribute energy or substrates is going to be a lot more difficult. VO2 max training is defined as the maximum rate that the body is capable of taking in and consuming oxygen. It is the best indicator of aerobic power and is the best way to train distance runners. Levels of work is about 90 to 100% of VO2 max. This is their 3K race pace. So obviously if your um, VO2 max is 120% um, is being used and the 800 meters, why? Because we're using neuromuscular power for that, that for, you know, almost 5% um, of the race. And then um, obviously it decreases as we prolong the distance and duration of uh, and minim, um, kind of moderate the intensity. Guidelines for training each event. So for all events, the first goal is to develop aerobic capacity. Next, the race demand will dictate the developing race specific energy system or energy sources. Endurance training follows the following progression. Aerobic development, VO2 max development, intervals, and then repetition. And then repetition. So what we need to do is we need to get our athletes, um, you know, build their aerobic development and their maximum aerobic capacity. And once we do these things, our athletes are going to be in a much better position to handle the demands of that specific event. So, for instance, the 800 meters, as we go into this now, we're going into an individual um, event breakdown. Um, the 800, there is little time to correct errors, 66 a percent is aerobic, 34% is anaerobic, and this is going to fluctuate depending on the athlete and the talent, but general guidelines here. Intervals with short recoveries early, followed by repetitions late. Okay, that's how, you know, as we're developing training. Race distribution is the first 400 meters runs about 30, three to four seconds slower than the PR in the open four. So these individuals must be pretty fast if they're going to run a good um, 800. The second lap is going to be two to four seconds slower than that first 400 meters. Okay. Um, 
And so when we look at that, that's about eight seconds slower than their um, PR 400 meters. So it's also a good way to determine intensity when it comes to training and training intervals and helping develop um, what we consider like pace and, and splits and breakdowns. 15 or 1600 meters, it's about 84% aerobic, 16% anaerobic. The aerobic power is more important than the 800 meters. Training at the lactate threshold is vital. Um, you want to do some intervals early in the season and repetitions later. A steady pace is the most economical way to do it. Um, slightly faster than the first um, and last 400s, even on the other two, um, just to obviously produce fast, the fastest times possible. When we look at this race distribution, it's pretty funny because I think back to when I was getting ready for my first 1500 and I, and I, with a straight face, cause I, I'm not used to this. I wasn't used to this stuff at the time. I go, coach, I think I got it. And I'm going to run a lap, walk like a hundred and then run another lap really hard, then walk like another hundred. And then I'll be able to break five minutes. It'll be easy. And they just kind of laughed at me because obviously when you stop, that's, you know, your body's still working and those substrates are still kicking in. And you're going to get worse over time with that distribution of intensity. So that was actually going to kill me, you know, a lot more than just kind of gutting out the 1500, you know, because I was doing an interval workout and I was like, I can't do this. This is going to be so hard. So I just think about that when I, um, every time I see these race distributions. But that being said, um, making sure that you talk to your athletes about splits and how to manage those things with the race distribution is critical because sometimes as these races now, as we increase the distance of these races, it's easy to get lost. It relates to like where you are in your race and how to strategize and plan tactically about making moves and about staying on tempo and pace and so on. So the 5K is 88% aerobic, 12% anaerobic. Um, run at about 97% of your VO2 max. That's training at this level is crucial. Um, and so just so you know, the California Community Colleges, our cross-country athletes compete about 5K, or our ladies compete specifically at 5K, and our men run four miles, so just a little bit above 5K. So when we look at this, that's why I put so much emphasis on the VO2 max, as you can see. The lactate threshold runs and the lactate threshold intervals every um, are very um, important elements. So what do we mean by this? We have to build our, lact our lactate threshold and our capacity for athletes but without putting them in a detriment. Um, and so how we manage and navigate our training is going to be critical because if we increase the intensity too soon or too high in the beginning, they're not going to be able to find what their lactate threshold is and be able to work through it appropriately. Intervals are much like uh, 1500 or 1600 meters uh, repeats, um, just less frequent. The 10K is 90% aerobic, 10% anaerobic. Um, higher volumes in training represent aerobic demand. Lactate tolerance work and interval work are longer and of um, higher volume than the 10K training or 5K training. Um, even pace is the best for faster times. So you're not going to see a lot of um, split distribution here. And uh, I definitely, if you're a track nerd, go back and look at the world championships in Qatar and the, the 10K splits. They're pretty amazing. 3K steeplechase. So this is a demand similar to the 5K and the 1500. Uh, the aerobic training components, obviously similar to the 5K. Times convert from a 3K time, about 35 seconds. So with the with that being said, intervals over barriers at least once a week. Um, even pace is best in this race plan. And you don't really want to go too high or too many reps with this just because um, with the barriers, because our athletes do need recovery, even with like my high end hurdlers, I'm not hurdling every day and you shouldn't do, you shouldn't do that even with, with steeple chasers either. The marathon. So we're going to look at, um, 97%, 97.5% aerobic and 2.5% anaerobic 
Every reliance on fatty acid is fuel, thus training should reflect the demand. Long duration easy runs are important as the marathon paces um, runs event specific. Raising lactate threshold improves fuel efficiency, thus sparing glycogen for um, later in the race. Long run volumes increase levels of level off and then increase the intensity over time. What we're pretty much saying is um, teach your body how to sustain and fluctuate its energy systems throughout just so that they become a little bit more adapted to the demands of the event or the race. So the inventory is associated with running. Um, these are definitely something that we're going to look at for aerobic and anaerobic capacity. Hill work is an effective anaerobic training choice. It's uh, a lactic hill work can be done at about five to 10% incline repetitions, about 20 to 60 meters with near complete recoveries. Um, glycolytic hill work will look like something like three to 5% inclines with repetitions of six to 600 meters with near complete recoveries. Longer rest for 600 to 1,000 can be done with shorter recoveries as VO2 max training will start to take place. So aerobic training inventories. So if you're just kind of looking at this chart and this is something that everybody will get, we'll be able to look at and distribute um, or determine the differences when it comes to race pace versus heart rate and then determining the recovery to get the, the desired um, type of workout and the, the benefits of that workout. So aerobic and training inventory, um, reps and sets, and, and again, recovery intervals are critical. Um, the volume is going to be determined by like a culminative component. So like how many, it's like how many miles are you doing or how many meters are you covering? That's just a good way to calculate the volume when it comes to these anaerobic activities. So steeplechase, um, when we look at steeplechase, uh, we'll take a look at this, but um, pretty much when we look at the steeplechase, I'm gonna go back here. I see a water barrier jump. So when we look at the steeplechase, um, there's 28 barriers or 28 barrier attempts. There's going to be seven water jumps. Um, the barriers are 36 inches for men, 30 for women. Um, we want to teach the ability to lead um, with either leg because if you have to go to your dominant leg, it's going to disrupt uh, too much and, and relates to like the flow and rhythm of the race. Um, and jumping in from a barrier into sand is a good way to teach it in the beginning um, to get over the water barrier. When we look at hurdle mobility and hurdle technique, we have to train this as it relates to a function of coordination and um, skill development. Um, the water jump, we're not really going to have athletes hurdle the water jump. They're going to place their foot on the hurdle or the barrier. They're going to get full extension off that takeoff. And then, like I said, you can use sand to help practice this. Um, when they step onto the barrier and they kind of like lunge or launch themselves, the goal is to land in as little as water possible. 
um, be aware of your athletes like ankle mobility and stuff because that water barrier is in a decline and they don't have good ankle mobility they can um, get a lot of lower extremity um, issues that are kind of um, can really be disruptive so just make sure you work on the lower extremity strength um, these athletes should have good um, eccentric you know capacity like good jumping ability is a good indicator um, not because of the barrier, just because of the load um, that they'll be able to handle coming off of the barrier. That's probably, you know, more of a dictator of success because a lot of people can get over the barriers. Because, but the, can they handle the demand of coming off of the barriers? That's going to determine it. Um, so there's also race walking. So international distances are 20K, 50K. Younger athletes usually go from 1,500 meters all the way up to 10K. The walker must have one foot in contact with the ground at all times. It's judged by the human eye. And if you get too many faults in a row, um, you know, you get disqualified. So some periodization considerations. So biomotor abilities. I think um, a coordination, agility, or under-trained components. I think too many distance coaches are too, coaches are too fixated on the running and the volume and the intensity of those things, and they're not spending enough time um, working on the athlete's coordination and agility be, and not really realizing how much of an impact that's going to have, especially at the later stages of the season and um, their ability to maximize their running mechanics and in, in, in essence, increasing their econ running economy, which, which should um, benefit to faster running times. Uh, what does strength conditioning look like? A lot of um, lower extremity work in the beginning, like calves, shins, ankles, knees, abductors, adductors, uh, making sure that you're working um, some of those those smaller muscles in the feet, so like a lot of sand stuff. Um, when then you want to look at a lot of core and isometric training in the beginning, whether it's like lateral holds, um, overhead squats, um, you know, Cuban shoulder press, where you're using multiple ranges of motion. Um, so using a lot of complexities and auxiliary, um, you know, strength conditioning exercises are really going to help your athletes stay healthy and maximize their overall athleticism, which should increase to, again, faster times. Tactical preparation. How do you prepare your athletes for certain races mentally and physically? Um, you know, taking them into play, like uh, we'll go into it in the cross country class a little bit more, but looking at tangents and how to take lines, especially when you're making sharp turns. Um, but now within track, like what do you do when you get boxed in and how do you handle that? Remember, like I said, you don't want to make a move on a curve. You want to make your moves on the straightaway. Um, you want to make sure you use every bit of that, you know, already pre-stored ATP to get out so you don't get boxed in or kind of put in the back. Um, and then a taper. So as you're planning your training, what does the taper look like? It looks like you're setting up your speed development and obviously tactical development, um, a little bit more race specific, whether an athlete has a hard time with, the, um, you know, like the one turn stagger for the 800 meter runners or running in alley, um, running in groups. So sometimes you might need to group your athletes together, have them, you know, run from the inside and, or start from the outside of a big alley or a big waterfall. So you can kind of mix those things up so your athletes get different looks and so that they're psychologically prepared. Um, physically, we want to make sure that we're not overloading the system too too late in the season. So too often um, with this taper, uh, coaches are giving distance runners too much speed work that they haven't necessarily prepared for. And what this ends up doing is kind of bogging them down and their adaptability to that speed work might not be where you want it and they might not peak where you want them to peak just because of the, that random influx of speed training. So uh, that's it for distance running and the distance events. Look forward to seeing you guys this week. If there's any questions, make sure you, you, know, you reach out to me and contact me. Take a look in your book and the coach's manual for more insight and more, and, um, more details as relates to uh, the training uh, specifications and um, some of the training elements for the different running events within the distance groups.